The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. This is Connie Ra. I'm Executive Director of the American Academy of Home Care Physicians. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the webinar uh, entitled Supreme Court Decision on the Affordable Care Act Implications for Home Care Agencies in the Field of Home Care Medicine presented by our very own Jim Piles. Jim, as I think all of you know, is an acknowledged national health policy expert. He and his firm represent many healthcare associations. We've been delighted to have him as an AAHCP board member uh, for, for a number of years. He was our and is our IAH legislative leader. And we're just delighted that he's been willing to volunteer his time and talents to do this webinar to share with us all his views as to the uh, implications of the Supreme Court decision for our field, but also more generally for the field of home care. Thanks so much. Uh, there, is, there will be time at the end for questions. So if you would type in your questions um, in the question box on the right-hand side of your screen, um, I will be sure to get as many answers as possible. Jim is going to present for about 45 minutes, and that will leave 15 minutes for questions. Thanks so much, and I'll turn it over to you, Jim. Thanks so much, Connie. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, really uh, glad you could join us. We, uh, we, we certainly live in interesting times. The decision by the uh, Supreme Court last week uh, was one of the most interesting decisions, probably perhaps the most interesting decision, uh, certainly in my 40 years of practicing health law in that the decision uh, came out in, in a way that uh, I don't think any of us had uh, anticipated. Some folks had thought the, uh, the court would uphold the constitutionality of the Affordable Care Act. Others thought it might strike down some provisions of it. But, but no one could have anticipated the, uh, the, the decision as it actually came out. So what I'm going to do today is I'm, I'm going to um, describe to you without getting into too much detail, what the court uh, did, uh, what was expected, what they actually did, the significance of the decision very generally, um, starting from sort of the 40,000 foot level and then drilling down to, uh, to, to, to lower levels and more detail. And, and I'll try to uh, describe what it looks like at this point. Uh, it means for you as both a purchaser of health insurance as well as a provider of health care services. In the first slide you'll see there the name of the, of the case, for those of you who like to keep track of these things, it's National Federation of Independent Businesses, or NFIB, versus Sibelius, handed down on June the 28th. And uh, as I mentioned, it's, it really is one of the most significant decisions of, of our uh, times and uh, certainly our, our professional lives. And as others have said, it's, it's going to be remembered as a decision on a par with respect to importance and, and weight with Brown v. Board of Education, which essentially uh, ended segregation in the part of the world where I grew up, uh, and Roe v. Wade, uh, which uh, was uh, significant for uh, determining women's rights. And um, uh, one of the things I think that was uh, you can see that makes the case so unusual and marked it as, as certainly a, uh, an extraordinary case was there were three full days of, of oral argument in March 26 through 28th. And I can't remember that uh, happening in any other case. I think the last time that happened, happened was back in the, in the 40s. And I've, I've thought, I've had a lot of reporters asking me what uh, is the bottom line significance of the decision. And I think that the, the bottom line significance is the speed with which this country is going to undergo health reform. Uh, we're going to have, we have to have health reform in this country because we have a health del care delivery system that we can no longer afford and it's getting more unaffordable each day. So the question was, are we going to start down the path of reforming the system now as provided in the Affordable Care Act, uh, or would it be delayed for five to seven years? That would have been the effect of the court invalidating uh, a major provision or even all of the Affordable Care Act. It would have 
pushed back health re reform probably for about five to seven years uh, because it would would have taken that long before Congress would have been willing to take up the issue again. Next slide, Connie. So, so what have we learned? Again, these are the some of the things I've been discussing with reporters who have uh, contacted me. And between March uh, 2010 and today, uh, one of the things I think we've learned is that legislation this sweeping must simply has to be bipartisan and if you if you look at it regardless of what political stripe you are you can see what's happened is this the the, the legislation was passed only with democratic support not a single republican in congress voted for it and i think you can see what that would mean if if the legislation then as it goes forward and is and is implemented over the years then the other party, the Republicans, are completely left out. In every election, they are just duty-bound, regardless of what you think of the, the philosophy, but they're just duty-bound to attack something that they did not vote for. So it just leads to a lot of uh, political strife and gridlock, as we see. Um, there will be a vote, I uh, believe, next uh, week. I believe, actually, I believe it's the 19th, coming up on July the 19th in the House, to repeal the whole bill. Of course, that's a rather meaningless vote in that uh, the Senate is still compo uh, controlled by uh, the Democrats, and, and that no, no, no motion like that or provision like that would clear the Senate. Plus, if it did by some extraordinary circumstance, then the president would veto, would veto it. So it's a re largely a ceremonial vote. Uh, the other thing that I think you see, and this is one thing that as a somewhat of a constitutional scholar I've, I've always been intrigued by, and that is that the people who came to this country uh, seem to treasure uh, their autonomy. Uh, they don't like to be ordered to do something. They don't like to be told to do something, especially by the government, e even it's, if it's in their own best interest. If you look at some of the polls and, uh, on, on the Affordable Care Act, when individuals are asked about individual provisions that, uh, that can no longer turn down people for pre-existing conditions, there's community rating, there are lower insurance premiums, a, a huge percentage of Americans are in favor of all of those individual ideas. But when you get to the mandate, uh, a more than half of the country doesn't like it. Doesn't like the fact that even if it might be good for them, that they would uh, the, that the federal government would be requiring them to purchase uh, health insurance. So we're just an independent bunch here, which I think is one of the reasons why the legislation we'll talk about later, the Independence at Home, has such appeal with the general pub uh, population or general public. Next slide. So what did we expect was going to happen? Uh, what did we expect would be the issues before the court, and how do we think they would probably come out? Of course, every lawyer in the country was asked their opinion before the case came down, and uh, certainly I was one of them. But um, we thought that uh, the, the pivotal question in the case would be whether uh, Congress had the power under the Commerce Clause to enact an individual mandate that is requiring individuals to purchase health insurance. And the Commerce Clause, which is in the main body of the Constitution, gives Congress the power to regulate commerce. So the question was, uh, when you uh, require someone who is not engaged in commerce to actually participate in the system, are you really regulating commerce or are you creating commerce? Uh, so that and, and we thought, thought the, the constitutionality of the case would rise or fall on that determination. And, and if it was not authorized by, uh, if the Affordable Care Act was not authorized by the Commerce Clause, then um, would the court also invalidate a couple of the insurance reforms, like the guaranteed issue, that is, insurance companies can no longer turn down people for pre-existing conditions and community rating which is to say that they could only set premiums on approximately four variables uh, that would uh, really speak to the risk in a community that they could no longer price people out of the market as uh, insurance companies have done in the past 
There's also a thought that, that Justice Kennedy would be the deciding vote. Uh, depending on which way he went, that is the way the court would likely go, because he's viewed as sort of the, the swing vote between the liberal group of the court, the members of the court, and the more conservative group, uh, members of the court. Um, most everyone said it was almost unthinkable that the court would invalidate the entire Affordable Care Act, because the Supreme Court you know, over the years has uh, taken the position that it, its job is to call balls and strikes, as uh, just, uh, Chief Justice Roberts said in his confirmation, to, to determine only which sections of a law are constitutional or unconstitutional, and leave it to Congress to decide then what to do with the remainder of a law. Um, and also, no, no court, uh, no lower court, district or court of appeals, uh, as the, these various cases came up to the Supreme Court, had held that the Medicaid expansion uh, was in any way invalid. And that's because, again, over the period of time since uh, Medicaid began, uh, the courts have been uh, essentially unanimous that uh, the federal government can put any strings it wants on the amount of money that it gives to the states under the Medicaid program. So there had not been really any case. There hadn't, hadn't been any lower court decision in this litigation that gave any indication that the Medicaid expansion would not be uh, upheld. Next next uh, slide. So what really happened? Uh, well, none of that. Uh, it was all different. By a five to four decision um, uh, written by uh, Chief Justice Roberts, uh, the court said Congress did not have the power under the Commerce Clause to enact the individual mandate. That uh, it could not uh, order people to participate in commerce in order to regulate it. Otherwise, they could uh, require people to buy Chevy Volts or broccoli or whatever that, that they felt was uh, good for the nation or good for the individuals. Uh, but uh, they, they did say, in the majority opinion, again, written by Justice Roberts and joined, he was joined by the more liberal members of the court, that Congress did have the authority to impose a tax on those who do not purchase uh, health insurance under the mandate. So. The, the uh, amount that has to be paid if you don't purchase insurance, um, the court held by a five to four decision was essentially a tax because you can always pay that amount and not get insurance and nothing happens to you. Uh, that you're, you're in complete compliance with the law if you do that. So it was not really a penalty because a penalty would have been, would have made you pay the fine and then buy insurance anyway. Um, but uh, Justice Roberts said no, he really thought it was, it was more in the nature of a tax, even though the statute itself, the Affordable Care Act itself, did characterize the amount that had to be paid by the individuals uh, as, a, as a penalty. Uh, but Justice Roberts felt, and he held, that it was the duty of the court, even if Congress didn't phrase the the, uh, the, the amount that had to be paid as a, as a tax. It was up to the court to determine whether uh, the entire legislation could be upheld uh, based on uh, finding that it was a tax. And he felt that it could be construed that way and therefore the court should do it. Um, this was the key difference. He felt that it was po since it was possible to construe the amount that had to be paid as a tax, the court had an obligation to do it to prevent the legislation from being struck down for being unconstitutional. The four conservative members of the court said, no, uh, we determined that Congress said it wasn't a tax, that it was instead a penalty, and that's the end of the matter for us. We're not going to look one step further to see whether we could construe it as a tax. So that was, that was the, the narrow difference on, on which uh, the uh, uh, the majority and the and the and the dissent turned. Um, then, astonishingly, uh, in the majority opinion, Justice Roberts said that the expansion of the Medicaid program was unconstitutional to the extent that uh, states would lose all of their Medicaid funding if they failed to um, expand their Medicaid programs to cover everyone 
up to 133 percent of the federal poverty level. So that was the way the statute was written. You, uh, the states were required to, regardless of what they had done in the past, they were required to offer Medicaid coverage to all individuals in their state who were at or below 133 percent of the federal poverty level. And if they didn't, they would not just lose any federal funding for those new beneficiaries, they would lose all federal funding for Medicaid. Um, Justice Roberts held in the majority that was uh, unconstitutional. That was beyond Congress's power to do that. So what that leaves us with now is the statute says states should uh, allow individuals up to 133 percent of the federal poverty level to sign up for Medicaid. But if they don't do that, if they elect to not expand their Medicaid programs, uh, they don't, don't lose any federal funding. So we'll see how that plays out. Next slide. Um, here's the way it broke out. Chief Justice Roberts wrote the majority decision for the court, joined by Justices Ginsburg, Breyer, Kagan, and Sotomayor. Those four are typically viewed as the more liberal members of the court. Justice Kennedy sided with the three conservative uh, members of the court, Scalia, Alito, and uh, Thomas, in dissent. The thing that's astonishing about this, and, and from whether you're a lawyer or non-lawyer, this is truly amazing. The court was one vote away from invalidating all of the Affordable Care Act, all 970 provisions. Um, it all came down to uh, Roberts' vote. Uh, and uh, he, he literally, as a single individual, has determined uh, the course of, of health care reform, certainly, and perhaps uh, the course of health care delivery in this country for the foreseeable future. Next slide. So what does it mean? Um, again, given, given in the few days I've had to think about it, um, I think what it means is that the, the Affordable Care Act will be uh, the new floor of health reform in America. Because even, even if uh, uh, in the next election somehow the president's, uh, the, the White House and, the, and Congress swing Republican, and even if it were to be invalidated, it will, whatever Congress does will always be measured against what they did do here and what the court upheld. Um, we now have, we're on the path by 2014 to have health insurance for every citizen, every citizen of America. Um, so any, anything else that is considered as a substitute will be measured against that because now for the first time in the, in really in the history of the country, we are going to have health insurance that is available for, for everyone. Um, now we're going to see a whole lot more insured people. Approximately 32 million additional Americans will have health insurance soon after uh, 2014. Roughly 20 million Medicaid uh, beneficiaries and about 12.5 million uh, individuals enrolled in, in private insurers, insurance. Um, and really th this just transforms uh, health insurance in this country because insurers have always had the opportunity to uh, avoid really high cost people or charge a whole lot more for them or charge so much for them that they just char price them right out of the market. So health insurers in the, in the, over the history of the country have not been in the, the business of spreading risk. They've been in the business of avoiding risk. And that, that just is, has, is about to come to an end. Um, and now they will have a whole lot more insured individuals. And the hope from the insurance companies is that they will have so many more healthy, younger individuals who do not cost very much uh, that that will more than offset having to uh, both insure sicker people and insure sicker people for lower premiums. So um, that's, that's their hope. Um, I think that's a question of whether that will happen. Um, new slide, please. Uh, so insurance companies now, as of 2014, at least for the insurance plans that participate in these state or federal exchanges, they will only be able to adjust premiums for four reasons, and that is 
whether you're a family or an individual, uh, based on the rating of the area. It's called community rating. They will look at the relative risks, say, in your community in um, Shreveport, Port Louisiana, or in New York City. And uh, they will then vary the allow the rates to vary based on the rating area. But it's, it's going to be based on the risk of all of the people in the area, regardless of whether those people have insurance. Um, so, and then also on the individual's age. So an old person like me would uh, be able, they could charge them a bit more than someone who is uh, who's younger. And then tobacco use is uh, the fourth way they can bury premiums. So that should have some impact on those who are still using tobacco. Cannot have lifetime or annual limits on, on payouts. Uh, that's uh, really uh, significant. And um, so because it used to be when someone came down with cancer, or in the past, up until now, if someone came down with cancer, a lot of times the health insurers would just pay up to the back maximum amount and essentially had no further liability. But um, so it means that insurance companies now are going to have a literally unlimited liability, or virtually unlimited, and continuing liability for some of these more chronic diseases, diabetes, cancer, those diseases that may last a very long time. The, um, also, they, uh, they must make, uh, under the Reform Act, the insurance companies must refund amounts uh, to their insured if they don't meet a minimum loss ratio. That means that uh, for uh, small to uh, mid-size uh, health plans, uh, they have to uh, pay out a minimum of 80% of the premiums they get as benefits. They have to pay out 80% as benefits. Uh, otherwise, uh, annually, otherwise they have to make a rebate or a re refund to the insured individuals or employers. For large group plans, they have to pay out uh, at least 85%. And we'll talk in a moment how you're going to, some of you are going to be getting some money back in the next couple of months. So next slide, please. Um, they must cover essential benefits. There's a package of essential benefits, which includes chronic care coordination. Again, it's the sort of thing they, the insurance companies in the past have not covered uh, and will have to begin covering uh, beginning on uh, 2014. They will also have to cover preventive care and screening services with no copayment. That uh, goes into effect for Medicare, Medicaid, and private insurance. Uh, and Medicaid will have to do that by 2013. But uh, private insurance and Medicare, uh, I think uh, Medicare is doing that now. Um, private insurance will have to have that coverage by 2014. Um, that means we're going to be looking in a previously uninsured population for disease. And the people who are going to be looking for that disease are going to be the people who are going to get paid to treat it. So I suspect what that's going to mean, since again, there's no copay here, we're going to see a lot more preventive care and screening. And for at least for, the, for a period of time, I suspect we're going to see the incidence of diagnosed diseases go up in this country. Because we know that previously uninsured populations tend to have a greater incidence of disease. If you, for example, the year before someone turns 65, I mean, the year after someone turns 65 and becomes eligible for Medicare, they typically have a big up spike in diagnosed disease because some of the, many of those people previously didn't have insurance prior to becoming eligible for Medicare. And um, of course, the uh, insurance companies will then be required to offer the coverage through a statewide exchange, which is established by the state. And if the state doesn't do it, as you may have heard on the news this morning, Bobby Jindal of Louisiana saying, no way, Louisiana is not having a state exchange. No way they're going to do that. Well, it just means the federal government will form one for them. So um, that's really not much of an out for the, for the states. Uh, next slide. Now, what we don't know, uh, we don't know how many states will refuse to expand the Medicaid uh, population to cover up to 133% of the, those, uh, up to 133% of the federal poverty level. 
we we hear uh, at least the, the reports I've seen so far that about six states have said they won't do that. Um, and I know there is a letter that's being sent out by a group of uh, House Republicans to try to convince states to to not accept the new federal match, which is a 100% uh, federal funding for new Medicaid uh, uh, patients for 2014 through 2016. And then from 2016 to 2019, it ratchets down to 90% of, of the federal match. That's still pretty advantageous, though. So I would be, frankly, in this tight economy, I would be really surprised if a lot of states uh, turned down that kind of federal funding. That Those would be huge federal dollars rolling into the state. Um, so um, and, and how many will not form exchanges? I, I, I think that's another question we don't know. Uh, Fourteen states in the District of Columbia have already formed health insurance exchanges. Now, these are exchanges where the, the plans sign up and then beneficiaries have a single place to go to choose among the uh, plans to decide which plans they want. The idea is it's supposed to increase competition among the insurance companies and help them keep their and uh, incentivize them to keep their premiums down. But a number of states are doing it. From what I've heard after the uh, uh, decision was announced, some states that had been waiting to see what the decision would be have now decided they are going ahead. I, I would suspect that most states will form exchanges. Um, Two states, the governors in two states have vetoed exchanges passed by the state legislatures. That's New Jersey and New Mexico. Um, but again, you've got these these folks are going to have to answer to the voters when they turn down exchanges, which are at least designed to make lower cost health care available to people in the state. That's it's a hard, kind of a hard argument to continue to to make. I think, uh, but we'll see. Next slide. Immediate impact of health care reform. Uh, this is one thing you might want to uh, look at soon. By August 1, the health insurers that failed to meet the minimum loss ratios, the, that is the expenditure of 80 to 85 percent of premiums on services, will have to begin paying rebates. And the total amount they're going to have to rebate is $1.3 billion to employers and individuals. Um, and just for by way of example, I, I pulled out of a Kaiser family publication, which I've linked for you at the bottom of this slide. Maryland, the total rebates would be eleven million three hundred fifty seven thousand one hundred and fifty seven dollars. Uh, the average per individual uh, rebate per individual in Maryland would be about two hundred ninety three dollars, which is not too shabby. I mean, it's a you know it's a meal at a decent restaurant. Um, and uh, Louisiana um, has total rebates. They will have total rebates of almost four million. And as you can see, the amount per individual goes down a bit. And then Virginia is uh, almost eight million. Uh, so check. I would advise you to check with your insurance carriers uh, on or near August one, and and find out whether you, as an employer or you, as an individual. Uh, are entitled to uh, rebates. Uh, if the court had struck down the law, of course, these rebates would not have been paid. But they will be now. They definitely will be paid, and have to be paid by somewhere around August the first. Uh, we checked, by the way, our firm did in D.C. And it looks like we will be entitled to a rebate, but the insurance company had not computed the precise amount yet. So we were all, we were happy to hear that. Next slide. Um, Impact on home health providers. Um, well, it means, of course, since the law was upheld, that all of the provisions that were in that are in the law are now going to go into effect, and they're going to go into effect fairly soon. Uh, the most sweeping uh, provision there that will apply to the Medicare home health benefit and home health uh, agencies is in Section 3131 of uh, the Affordable Care Act, and it. And it calls for, or at least authorizes, some rather sweeping changes in the way home health agencies are reimbursed. It says that beginning 2014, uh, reimbursement will be, it doesn't say may, so will be adjusted 
to reflect changes in visits per episode. That's changes in visits per episode from when home health was cost reimbursed back in two, before 2000 uh, to today. Because we know what has happened is home health has gone to prospective payment. The number of uh, the volume of visits has been cut roughly in half because there's an incentive to 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 provide fewer visits rather than more, as it was the case under the old cost reimbursed system. The mix of services uh, the, it'll be adjusted to reflect the mix, mix of services in an episode, the average cost of services per episode. This is something that MedPAC has been wanting for the last few years. They wanted home health. To, to be reimbursement, to be more closely related to the cost of providing the care. And this is because they, MedPAC believes that home health uh, agencies have a 17% profit margin, which they say is higher than any other uh, group of providers. Uh, I frankly find that a little hard to believe, but that's, that's, that's the prevailing wisdom at MedPAC and, and in, among many members of Congress. And then there are other relevant factors uh, that the secretary can take into account. So we don't know quite what those might be. The secretary is also authorized. This is not required, but but the secretary or CMS is also also authorized to make adjustments for differences between hospital-based and freestanding home health agencies, and for-profit and non-profit home health agencies. This this could be deadly for the industry because it could kick off sort of a internecine war between the for-profit and the non-profit home health agencies. We saw this with the, the years ago, back in the 80s and the 90s, with the wars between the for-profit hospitals and the non-profit hospitals, the net uh, uh, conclusion of which was that they both bring something to the table. Uh, they both have their, their disadvantages as well, but it's probably best to allow uh, a reimbursement system where where both types of models can exist, but anyway, these are what this does. If you since we don't know exactly what's going to uh, these recommendations are going to be, it does inject some instability into reimbursement for home health, and we do know that the home health benefit has been cut uh, by CMS every year since 2008 uh, through the present. So it looks like there's going to be more. Um, more instability there uh, for the at least between now and 2014, unless something changes. Next slide.